I've forgotten liturgies many a time too myself, so no penalty for that, of course. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll be looking specifically at verses 7 through 19 this evening. It's been a little bit of a while since I've had the joy of preaching to y'all from the book of Hebrews. Uh, so we're going to pick back up where we left off, actually. Uh, you know, a lot of times in the Puritan era of the church during the Great Ejection, and John Calvin himself as well, actually. Uh, Calvin was kicked out of the city of Geneva several times, but one time he was kicked out of the city of Geneva, went to Strasbourg for several years, and then was able to come back to Geneva and picked up literally from the same spot that he had left off, and that was about five years earlier, too. So I think that uh, we'll just continue onwards, even though it's been a few months from the book of Hebrews. Uh, also, I had the opportunity recently to write a, uh, an article on this section of the book of Hebrews as well for a, a, a magazine in Northern Ireland. Uh, so it's been a fun study through this book, I must add. Uh, so as you all all know, if you've talked to me at all, I like covenant theology. I like the book of Hebrews also because of that. And it's been a joy and a privilege to get to study through this and to bring the word of the Lord to my church family here. So if you would, look at verse 7. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter, and then we will jump into the exposition of it. So we read, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me, and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was angry with His generation, and said, They always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another, day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For if we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Brothers and sisters, would you join me this evening in a word of prayer as we go before our triune God for an understanding of this text. Father in heaven, the most eloquent and gifted of preachers on all the earth could do nothing with the gospel of Christ apart from your Holy Spirit. For it is your Holy Spirit that makes the gospel effectual and that brings salvation to its hearers and that edifies the body of believers. It is not the eloquence of the preacher. It is not his choice of wording. It is not his skill or his gifts even, but it is the Holy Spirit working in and through that which he says, through the scriptures. So, Lord, we pray that you would illuminate us by your Holy Spirit, that you would give us wisdom and understanding of this text as only that can come from God above, the author of all of Scripture. Father, cause us to heed the warnings of this text. Cause us to reflect on what the Scripture has to say about such a monumental thing as apostasy and unbelief. Help us to heed the warnings which you and your Son and the Holy Spirit have given to us. Give them to your church again, Father, for we must often hear these things again if we wish to keep on the straight and narrow pathway. For, Father, we know that it is your Son and your Spirit who keep us on it, for we are saved by Christ from beginning to end. There is nothing in and of ourselves that merits such a benefit. So, Father, we pray that you would be with us this evening by your Spirit to your Son's glory as we seek to understand and unpack this text. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, if you look at a lot of what's going on in broader evangelicalism right now, if you look at what's going on with some once popular figures, uh, some who were even of the Young Restless Reform movement for a little while, uh, it's a movement that was very popular, especially some 10 or 8 years ago, of young men and young pastors who came into the faith or came out of broadly evangelical churches and discovered the writings of such men as Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin, and, and others as well. They sought to read Puritan literature too. But many of those people, 
even having read those things, even having been preachers themselves, some of them, even having been great theologians of the faith, have begun to call themselves ex-evangelicals as they leave the evangelical faith. One such of these, John Piper's son, actually, a man by the name of Abraham Piper, who has around 2 million followers on the social media platform TikTok, and every one of his videos, nearly every one at least, is a rant against what he calls fundamentalist evangelical Christianity. Now, he will tell you, plain and simple, that his problem is not with Christianity, but it's with all the parts of Christianity. It's with the gospel. It's with a God who has wrath upon his people. Or not upon his people, but upon others who are not his people. And who chooses some to salvation and then passes over others. He has a problem with true doctrines of Christianity. Or take, for instance, the famous pastor, Josh Harris, who didn't like what the church had to say about professing homosexuals or those who were living in unrepentant sin. Now, his problem was with the doctrine that says that such as these shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Josh Harris didn't like that. Now, these men, one of them a son of one of the most foremost pastors and preachers in the United States, and one of them a foremost and largely known pastor himself, these men have seen souls saved. They've heard the voice of God through the preaching of the word. They've sat underneath some of the greatest ministers of our day and age. They know what the scriptures say. They know what sound preaching is. They may have even been ordained to the ministry of the word and of the sacrament. They may be God-fearing and faithful Presbyterians even. They may have read through the Westminster Confession. They may have been catechized by children. But are these people apostates? Now, an apostate or apostasy requires a definition as well. Now, in the original Greek, where we get the word apostasy from simply means rebellion or disobedience. Now, an apostate is one who is in utter rebellion against God. You know, Hebrews goes into these warning passages very often. Remember earlier on we discussed that Hebrews has a very sermonic-like influence. It's, it's got a homiletical style. It reads almost like a sermon. Our apostle goes back and forth. He begins with doctrine, and he unpacks that doctrine using the scriptures. And he's giving you these wonderful and great doctrines as he's cautioning his people not to apostatize. Remember that he is writing this primarily to Hebrew Christians who during this time are just beginning to experience a little bit of persecution. They're beginning to get kicked out of the synagogue. The Jews are realizing that they may be heretics, according to the Jewish faith at least, and they're pushing them out of the synagogue. Now, for that to happen to the Jewish person of the time is tantamount to death itself. You're cut off from your family. You're cut off from any means of help that you have within the community. If you come on hard times or if the Romans come through and burn your village and you're a Christian instead of a Jew, they're not going to help you. They don't think that you're one of the people anymore. You've apostatized from the Jewish faith. Now, our author is warning us once again what the penalty of apostasy is. He is writing to these people, and these people have seen wonders. They've heard wonders. They've even tasted wonders. Hebrews chapter 6 said that they even tasted of the Holy Spirit. Some of these people are baptized Christians, or claiming to be as such. Are they really born again? Well, of course not. Our systematic theology informs us on that. We know that once you are saved, you cannot lose that salvation. And Hebrews makes that clear as well, even in chapter 6, right after the warning passage, as he says... We have better ideas for you, brethren. But he is still warning us. Uh, I had the benefit of taking a course solely on the book of Hebrews when I was in college. And this warning, it's not just for those outside of the church. It's for those of us who are inside of the church. Remember, he is speaking not to non-believers. He's speaking to those who are believers. He's speaking to people who are in the faith, who profess Christ, who may have even been baptized. So he's giving you examples, he's giving you warnings, and he's giving you the remedy for preventing this heinous crime against God. So what I want us to think about, brethren, is this. Hebrews warns against deserting the greater Moses from the Old Testament. He teaches how to prevent apostasy, and by example, what apostasy is. He's going to do those three things in our text. 
Now remember my previous message as well, if you want to go back to it, it's of course in our files on Sermon Audio or such. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that if you want to. I'm not forcing you to, of course, but you're more than welcome to if you want to. It's on there for your pleasure. Uh, But before this, though, in verses 1 through 6, as we look at the context, what our author has been building is that Christ Jesus is greater than Moses. Now remember, these people are going back to their former lives in Judaism. Paul talks about that in other books of the Bible as well. His training as a Pharisee, that he was the Pharisee amongst Pharisees even, and what he had left behind in the Jewish religion. And these people are beginning to drift backwards into it, or they're beginning to wax and wane on some of their understandings of Christian truth, or they're compromising. But the doctrine of Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, shows that Christ is the greater Moses because a servant, Moses, is less than a son. So Hebrews is exhorting or encouraging and warning Jewish Christians to continue onward, even if leaving the church is very tempting. And don't we see that in our day and age as well? It's nothing new, of course. We've had problems with apostasy in every age. Even the the apostle in 1 John writes, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Don't think that this is anything new. We see it because our world is so connected now. But there's always been apostasies ever since the first century AD. And there's going to be more apostasies in the future as well. Paul talks about that in so many areas, including 1 Thessalonians. But what the apostle is wanting to do is he's going to warn us with that understanding that Christ Jesus is indeed greater than the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Moses. He's going to warn us. If we reject what the builder of the house has said, that is, Jesus Christ, the one who builds the church and built the Old Testament church under Moses, if we reject what he has to say, there's no hope for us. Now, one who breaks the law carries with it the death penalty for that person. For it is written, he who keeps the entire law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. That of all is eternal damnation. That's what happens when we break the law. But there is a way of escape. It's by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the way of escape. But if we reject the way of escape, then what hope do we have? The answer is we have no hope. So Hebrews is going to give us that warning. He's going to show us from the scriptures, and his scriptures, of course, the Old Testament. He's going to give another example of what exactly that is and what merits that condemnation. And then he's going to give us the remedy as well, how to prevent this from happening. And first off, in verses 7 through 11, we're going to see the Old Testament warning against apostasy. And our apostle here is quoting from Psalm 95, and we read, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So remember what that therefore, and the cliche is, what is the therefore, therefore, of course. And what is the therefore for? It's pointing you back to verses 1 through 6. Because Jesus Christ is greater than Moses, because Moses is a servant, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he is greater than Moses. Moses even testified to that. Uh, We recently went through the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday morning with Steve's Steve's, uh, sermon series uh, from Peter's life. And we see that Moses is indeed giving credence to the message that Christ gave, as well as Elijah. Moses testified about Christ Jesus and said that he was indeed greater than him. We read that in Deuteronomy chapter 18 with the prophecy of the Lord will raise up for amongst you a prophet like me. You will listen to him. So we're going to see the Old Testament warning here. Remember too, just as the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit is the author of the New Testament by the work of men, of course. He uses men in that way. He carries them along so that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when they write on the pages of Scripture, they write inerrantly and infallibly. Now, what you read here, of course, there's nothing wrong in it. There's nothing contrary to fact. There's nothing that's just mere opinion or conjecture. The Holy Spirit also stated this in the Old Testament. So the apostle is going to take us back to the Old Testament and say, let me show you what the Bible is going to say about apostasy. And we read, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Now we see that the warning is not to test God as in prior times. This is going to go through the first part 
of verse 10 as well. Now, in the original Hebrew, this was the waters of Meribah. This was the waters of testing. We read that in the book of Numbers as well, that Moses was commanded to go and speak to the rock, and out would come water. The people were once again rebelling. They were wanting to go back to Egypt. They were cursing God with every breath that they had because they thought he had brought them out into the wilderness to die when they were fat and happy in Egypt. Their words as well. At Meribah, Moses even got so exasperated with the people that he didn't trust the Lord when he said, go and speak to the rock. Instead, he takes his staff and strikes it. And for that, he is not allowed to go into the promised land, into the land of rest. And other times, the people hardened their hearts and provoked the Lord to wrath. Think about the golden calf in Exodus. Just as soon as Moses descends from the mountain, after they have committed themselves to the Lord's care, after they have said, we shall do all the works that are written in this law, they immediately go to sin. They immediately apostatize. They shamelessly leave the Lord for gods that are not him, that are not the true God. In fact, even his brother Aaron makes for them a calf after taking all of their golden jewelry and melting it down and saying, Behold, your gods who have brought you out of Egypt, O Israel. Of course, Aaron's there by way of a side too. His, his reasoning for that is very laughable as he says to Moses, The gold just got thrown in there and out popped this calf. I don't know how it got here. Now, let us not say that sin doesn't boggle the mind and clouds our every judgment and reason, for that's what it does. But our apostle is showing us from this text that they saw his works prior to and after these acts. Now, the wilderness generation that came out of Egypt with Moses and Exodus through Deuteronomy that were brought out of slavery, that God had shown all of these wonders to, They had seen the judgment of Egypt. They had seen hail fall from the sky. They had seen the angel of the Lord pass, and every one of the firstborn of Egypt was killed in judgment. They saw great wonders out in the desert. They saw the cloud of the Lord go before them in the Shekinah glory cloud and a pillar of fire by night. They saw bread itself, manna, fall from the heavens. We haven't seen that before. These people had seen such great works prior to and after all of these acts all throughout the Old Testament period. This is what the Lord says, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. That's not just one act or one miracle. These people had seen the acts and works of God for 40 years straight. I can tell you with my knee pain sometimes, I feel like I've been around for a lot longer than I have, but I haven't seen 40 years on this earth just yet. These people had seen 40 years straight of the Lord providing for them day after day after day in the wilderness. He brought forth water from a rock. He sent birds to fly on the ground so that way they could have meat because they complained that they didn't have enough meat. They saw Moses' face shining with gold as he came down from Mount Sinai, having communed with the Lord for 40 days. What's the result of all of this? We see the wrath of God upon their rebellion in 10 through 11. Therefore, on account of all of this that they have seen, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. It was God himself who showed the people of Israel these great works. It was God himself also who made an oath. You see that in verse 11, I swore in my wrath. In the Hebrew, this is what is usually used as the Hebrew oath formula. If you go back to Psalm 95, the Lord actually made an oath that this generation, the wilderness generation, would not enter the land of promise. They would all die in the wilderness. And that came true. There were only two who entered the promised land from that generation, Joshua and Caleb. They were found faithful. Now, does this mean that all of them were not believers? Probably not. We know that Moses was a believer. Aaron was a believer, of course, as well as Miriam. But the vast majority of the wilderness generation fell in the desert, and their bones are there even today. 
These people did not know the ways of the Lord. They refused to submit to him. And because of that, God made an oath to not allow them into the land. Now, we see here, brothers and sisters, the penalty of breaking the law of God is death. These people continually apostatized. Frank was going through the book of Judges recently, and the story of Judges can be summed up in one word. It's apostasy. That's what the people of Israel continued to do. You see that in the judges' cycle constantly and constantly. You see that they believe in the Lord for a time. Then they reject him. They begin to go after the Baals and the other idols of Canaan. And then they cry out to the Lord after they are dominated for some time underneath these people. The Lord sends a judge to save them. And then it's all back over again and again and again. You would think that they would learn their lesson, but they just didn't. And because of all of this, God brought death to most of them. In fact, he would say later to Elijah, don't worry, I have 7,000 people who still have not bent the knee to Baal in the northern kingdom. And how many people were in the northern kingdom at that time? Millions. Millions. 600,000 plus more were brought out of the land of Egypt. Some estimates, if you read certain commentators, will say that over a million people came out of the land of Egypt. All of these saw the great miracles that the Lord had brought and wrought. But the breaking of the law of God is death. But there is a way of atonement. There always is a way, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. We who know that we have broken God's law, we still have a way out from his just and holy wrath, and that is through the cross of Christ Jesus. That is the way of escape. We cannot get there simply by good works or by simply heeding the warnings of Scripture. We must escape God's wrath through the cross. Now, brethren, if we know God's words work and His power, we'll be punished if we reject it. We have the benefit of being in a Bible-believing church. We hear hear the gospel week after week after week. We hear the word preached faithfully. Did these people not have the same thing? I would venture to say that Moses was probably a stronger believer than anybody in this church. I mean, the man did see God's back. These people in the wilderness generation sat under the preaching of not just an ordinary man. They sat underneath the preaching of Moses, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, the one who was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. But brethren, we who have heard the full extent of the gospel preached, have even more revelation than Moses did. Why is that? Because we have the New Testament and the Old combined. We know what the works of God are from beginning to end. We have the beginning of the story in Genesis chapter 1. We have the end of it in Revelation 22. We have the entire revelatory history of God in your fingertips on your cell phone or in your book, in your Bible. And if we reject what God has given to us, that great privilege that he has allowed us to see, if we know these things, we will be severely punished should we reject it. That's a warning especially. I I have the privilege of working with our young people here. And you must warn every now and again, should you reject what you have been taught, what is going to happen in the eternal state? The promise for those who broke the law is certain death. But will punishment be even more severe for the one who has been able to sit underneath preaching? You know, often people will say the man on the island or the the person who's never heard the gospel of Christ Jesus, well, what's going to happen to him? Well, he's punished. Of course. He knows a little bit of something. He's still punished, according to Romans chapter 1, for his sin. But how much more will you and I be punished should we reject what Christ Jesus has offered to us in the gospel, even more than the wilderness generation? By way of illustration, Judas Judas Iscariot knew the Bible better than we do. He was a good first century Jew. He went to the temple. He was circumcised on the eighth day, most certainly. He followed the Old Testament law to a T sometimes. He walked with Jesus Christ himself physically, saw more miracles done than we ever have or ever will. The man walked with Jesus for three years, yet he was a scoundrel, the Bible says. Christ Jesus, of course, knew that he was an apostate. He knew that at the Last Supper as well, yet he was still a rebel. 
So who will be punished more for what they have? Is it Judas Iscariot, who saw Christ Jesus in the flesh and heard the gospel preached from the very Son of God's mouth? Or is it the wilderness generation? Both of them are punished severely. So what is the author of Hebrews doing here? He's giving us a warning using his Bible. Now we need to anchor what we say, of course, from the pulpit. And in our exhortations, in our daily speech, we need to anchor what we claim to be true in the Bible. Now, that's just what the author of Hebrews is doing. Because what he's about to say, evidenced by that take care brethren, he's going to anchor it in his Bible. Now, for us of here who have the opportunity to preach, we must do the same thing. We must anchor our warnings, our exhortation, our exposition. Everything we say and do must be anchored in the Scriptures. That's what the author of Hebrews is doing. He's not simply giving them an arbitrary warning that he's come up with off the top of his head. No, brothers and sisters, he's anchoring what he's saying in the biblical text. Remember, too, from this, before we transition to our next point, is that with great gifting, privilege, and learning comes great responsibility and a great price. You have the entire canon. You have the benefit of almost 2,000 years of church history behind you. You have the benefit of being able to freely go to a church without getting shot at or cursed to your face. You have a great privilege, but remember with that great privilege comes a great responsibility and a great price if you reject what you have been served. So brothers, my question to you is, do you take note of what the Bible has to say regarding any given subject? Do you take note of what the Bible has to say about how not to become an apostate? Do you take note of the examples that the Bible gives you? Because the Bible is giving you an example right here. And he ends it with, in the beginning, today if you hear his voice. Brothers and sisters, if you hear his voice, do what he says. Do not harden your hearts as the wilderness generation did. That is the absolute worst thing that we can do in response to the preaching of the gospel. Lord today by Lord today. Should you harden your heart and reject the voice of Christ which you hear from the pages of Scripture because the Holy Spirit himself is the author of Scripture first and foremost, how much more severe will our punishment be? We must test ourselves by these things. Moving on to my second point, which is the prevention of apostasy. Because our author is not going to simply leave us in despair wondering if there's any hope for us if those who ate manna didn't have any hope. He's going to give us some hope here in verses 12 through 14. We're going to see the prevention of apostasy. First, we see the prevention is simply by caring. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. This is the first step in preventing apostasy. What is that? Simply taking care. Watching over yourself. Testing yourself. The Apostle Paul commands us to do that. It's an imperative verb. It's not simply a suggestion to maybe you should test yourself every now and again. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians commands that. Test yourselves to see if you are truly in the faith. We too should be doing the same things. So we must prevent apostasy first and foremost by caring. Once again, this take care is an imperative verb in the Greek text. What that simply means is it's not a suggestion. It's a command. He commands us to take care. He commands us to do all of these things. What is he commanding us to do? First, it's prevention by watching our hearts in the verse in, uh, the rest of 12 there. That there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now, Jeremiah, of course, reminds us that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? Now, the heart is a very fickle thing. It's a very deceiving and deceptive thing as well. Because even the greatest of saints will realize that their heart is not right. It's desperately wicked. Even such great saints as Charles Spurgeon realized that. The hymn writer who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood, William Cowper realized that as well. The man was thrown into despair constantly. Or Martin Luther realized that as well. That's one of the things that jump-started the Protestant uh, Reformation. Excuse me. Was Luther realized that my heart is deceitfully wicked, and no matter how many times I confess it to a priest, it's not doing me any good. The apostle is saying, Watch your heart. 
prevent apostasy, prevent that falling away and rebellion by watching your heart, watching your thought life, watching all of your emotions, watching all of your thought patterns, watching everything in your mind, soul, spirit, heart, and strength, watching what your hands do. How do you watch these things and how do you remedy it? He also gives us the, that remedy by saying that it falls away from the living God. Now, what he's saying here, too, is that you should turn to the living God. First and foremost, how do you prevent apostasy? It's not just by watching your heart, because your heart's going to tell you what your brain wants to hear. You do it by turning to the living God who knows the heart. That second part in Jeremiah, after Jeremiah cries out, the heart is deceitfully wicked, the Lord says, I, the Lord, know the heart. How do you know the heart? How do you know your heart? It's not simply by looking inward in a mystic kind of fashion. It's by turning to the living God. That's what repentance is. Repentance is simply turning from what you were once doing and turning to a better way. That better way is the way, the truth and the life. It's Christ Jesus. It's the living God. Another way of preventing, a third way, is by exhortation. I notice the but there in verse 13. Whenever there's a but and a contrast in Scripture, we always want to pay attention to it. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The sinful heart is going to harden itself constantly. My pastor growing up was a shrimper and a fisherman. and would always give the illustration that a ship or a boat tethered to a dock is not going to go anywhere with the rolling tides. Why? Because it's tethered to something that's stationary. It's not going to move. If you leave that boat untethered, though, what's going to happen to it after a few hours? You're not going to have a boat anymore because it's going to be 30 miles out in the ocean. Having grown up on the Gulf Coast, I can testify to the truth of that as well. There are plenty of people who simply just forgot to tether their boat to the dock, and then they don't have a boat any longer. So how do you remain tethered? You exhort one another. Now, exhortation is a, uh, this is the word that we actually get paraclete from which is another title for the Holy Spirit. This is comforting one another, what the Holy Spirit does. This is the duty of the elders, yes, but it's also the duty of every born-again, Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian. The particular duty of the elders is to exhort, admonish. We are called, uh, as or the elders are called to exhort and admonish one another, to teach sound doctrine. That is incumbent upon them, yes, but the author to the Hebrews is not just giving this to the elders and the deacons and the pastors of the church. He's saying that this is the duty of every Christian. You are called to come alongside one of another. How many people would have never left the church if other believers would have simply came alongside of them and said, I know what you're going through. I'm here to help. I'm here to listen. I'm here to come alongside of you. I can tell you, too, having worked around a lot of young people and college students before, and homeless people as well, to my great shame, this would have helped out a lot if I had paid more attention to these verses, too. Coming alongside those who are younger in the church. Coming alongside those who are older in the church. How do you prevent them from falling away and going out to sea and being destroyed by the winds and the tides of the world? You comfort them. Doesn't that what Jesus does to us? The apostle to the Hebrews is going to come in later and say, we have such a great high priest who's been tempted as we were, yet was without sin. I don't know of any more comforting words than that. To know that my God, the one who died for me, the one who stood in my place on Calvary, is also a comforter and an exhorter. And he calls me to do the same thing. And he calls you to do the same thing. So brethren, let us prevent apostasy, whether it's in young or old, whether it's in black and white, whether it's a faithful churchgoer or one who's beginning to fall by the wayside. Let us comfort them. Let us exhort them. Let us admonish, if necessary, if they are in the throes of sin. Let us come alongside of them, for that's what we're called to do. How do we prevent those things from happening in the church? We come alongside people. We take care of our own. That's what the apostle to the Hebrews is saying not Ethan McCarter. Fourthly, and probably the most, the biggest preventative, is by partaking of Christ. Verse 14, For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. 
Now, we as faithful Calvinists as well believe in the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, or that if you were born again truly, you will persevere to the end. You're not going to apostatize. The apostle of the Hebrews, of course, knows this. As I said earlier, he's going to talk about that in chapter 6, right after the biggest warning passage as well. But if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, which is Christ Jesus, firm until the end, we are not going to apostatize. We're not going to fall by the wayside. Why? It's because that partaking of Christ, our union to Christ, is what is going to get us from the beginning of our Christian life to the very end of it. Isn't it comforting, too, brothers and sisters, that our Christian life doesn't rely upon what you or I do? Because if left to ourselves, if we were relying on our own strength of arms, we would surely fail. John MacArthur once said, if you could lose your salvation, you would. Why? Because the heart is deceitfully wicked. Desperately so as well. But Christ is the one who is going to cause us to persevere. Christ is not going to leave us if we are truly his. Is that not comforting? So how do you prevent apostasy? Fourthly, you cling hard to Christ Jesus. You hold on to him. And it doesn't matter exactly how hard you hold on to him because he's holding hard on to you. Every time that we start to slip a little bit off the narrow path, every time we start to go by the wayside, Christ Jesus, if we are truly his, is going to grasp us and say, come back. And it's going to set us aright. Our strength does not depend on our works, not upon the fickleness of the heart, which changes so often. It depends upon the man on the cross, our great high priest, our elder brother in the faith, our God and our master, who has said to us in the scriptures, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise that you can take 100%. If we are partaking of Christ, if we are united to him by faith, if we are actively seeking his face, the comfort of that is you're not going to desert the faith once delivered to the saints. Why? Because we know the God of the saints. We know Christ Jesus. So exhortation, we have caring, watching our hearts, and union to Christ. All of these things, they come from our union to Christ. You know, another illustration as well, recently at our house, we've had all of our chickens running around like crazy. Uh, the landlady actually, and I hope she doesn't listen to this, but uh, actually I do. She needs to take care of it. The chickens have been running around a lot lately. The gate got open and they're all escaping everywhere. Now, the gentleman of the house, his Australian shepherd, went and actually pinned one down the other day. And the chicken thought that it was probably done for actually because it was just shocked laying there after the dog had had it in its mouth and my wife screamed at it. Chickens are not the brightest of creatures, nor are they the most fearsome of creatures. Kind of like sheep in a certain way, too. They really don't have anything to defend themselves with. They're not bright by any means. They're governed by one thing, and that's their stomachs. They're looking for bugs constantly or their next meal. That's all that they're worried about in life. Maybe every now and again they'll give us another egg. But they keep leaving their enclosure. Now, where's the safest place if you're a chicken? It's in that enclosure with the giant Great Pyrenees dog that is not going to let a single finger get laid on those chickens. I can tell you that even though that dog is the laziest dog that I've ever seen, she's not going to let the chickens get eaten, not on her watch. Not to mention if somebody were to steal the things, that's a 150-pound dog at the minimum. If you don't know her, she's scary to look at. Brethren, if we stick next to the giant dog in the room, Christ Jesus, the one who has gone before us, we're not going to fall away from the faith. Why? Because his arms are a whole lot stronger than ours are. And if he's holding us fast, we're not going to fall away. One of my favorite hymns begins with these lines. Though I fear my faith shall fail, Christ will hold me fast. Though the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by faith at such a cost, he will hold me fast. Christ Jesus holds you in his arms, brethren. 
how to prevent falling away? Believing in him. He's not going to let your soul be lost. His promises are good. He simply holds his arms out to us all the day long. So brethren, have you checked your heart regularly? Are you actively seeking Christ Jesus? And are you coming alongside the church? And by that I don't mean the building. I mean one another. Are you coming alongside believers and saying, I know what you've been through. I'm here to help. How much better the church in the world would be if we had such a ministry among our saints. Robert Murray McShane as well also once said, For every look I take at myself, I take three at Christ. Remember that, brothers, if that's the only thing you take away from the sermon. Look to Christ. He's not going to let us fall away. Thirdly and finally, as we wrap up, we see the final example of apostasy. And our writer is going to go back up and say, While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Notice that today, too. It's a very strong word. Why? Because the time is now. If you're thinking about leaving, or if there's a problem, you don't wait three years to tackle that problem. You go today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Brethren, let's rest on that for a second and not go to the rest. We'll pick that up at a later time. The reason why is because of that today. If the Old Testament people, if their unbelief merited such a condemnation, how much more for the one who rejects Christ? Let us hear the words and heed the warning of the apostle. Today, if you hear the voice of Christ, do not harden your heart. That will have detrimental effects on you later on, for our young people or those who might hear this sermon over the internet. My prayer is that if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hear the voice of Christ and run to him. He will take you. He will hold you in his arms all the day long. And though you may kick and scream and fight to get away from him, he's going to hold you stronger all the more. And I guarantee that the one who wrestled with Jacob Christ himself, yes, in the Old Testament, is not going to let you prevail over him. Because he is sovereign, and he is good to his word, and he has said that he will not allow us to fall away. Brethren, today, if you sit here or hear this sermon and do not know Christ Jesus, if you are considering leaving all that you have heard and saying, I count it as nothing, and I throw it by the wayside like common trash into a bin, Hear the voice of Christ. Do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not do what the wilderness generation did, who merited condemnation. Do what the apostle to the Hebrews commands, which is hold on to Christ. Stronger than any boat tether. You hold on to him, he's not going to let you get destroyed. That's a promise from the scriptures. So brethren, I want us to leave with this. Are we actively following Scripture's commands to continue running this race of endurance? The race is a long one. Hebrews is going to talk about that in chapter 12 as well if we, if we ever get to that point. How do you run this race with endurance? You go with the one who sprinted already and has won the race. That's Jesus Christ. I'm not exactly a fast runner. I never have been. But I know that he is. Why? Because he's gone before me and he's completed the race. He's kept the law in its entirety. He has died and suffered in my place. And he says, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The wilderness generation did not enter that land of rest. Are you going to enter into it? The heavenly Mount Zion. Because if we leave the only sure hope of salvation in Christ Jesus, there is no hope. But if we cling to him, there's hope in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. O most holy God, we thank you for your son Christ Jesus. Because though our faith is often cold, though it is often as small as a mustard seed, though it often doubts and though it often complains, it is not based on what we do, though you have given us means to do such many and great things as you have commanded here in this text. 
But it's first and foremost that we hold to Christ by faith. And if we hold to Christ, we cannot fail because it is He who holds us. Father, that is my prayer for whoever hears the sermon. That if they are not a believer, that they will run to the Savior and cling to Him. And if they are a believer, that they will cling even harder to the Lion of Judah. For He has fought the battle and it is won. Father, cause us to not flee from the message delivered once and for all to the saints. Cause us to run this race with endurance. Call this church and other bodies across the nations to come alongside of their members and to exhort them to continue onwards, to not look back at the former life, but to continue pressing onward to the prize just as the Apostle Paul commanded it. We ask all of those things in the holy and precious name of Christ Jesus. Amen.